Good morning. Welcome to our webinar this morning. This is the, the February iteration of our KTI Unlocking Knowledge Transfer series. And for those of you that are new to this webinar series, we've designed these events to really shine a spotlight on the Irish research system and the expertise available within it. And we really want these events to serve as a way that you can see all the great stuff that's happening across the Irish universities and institutes of technology and look at ways that you can tap into that research for the benefits of your business. So this morning's event is going to focus on the role R&D plays in Ireland's response to climate change. And very pleased to be joined by two great speakers this morning. We have Professor Brian O'Gallacor, Director of the Marai SFI Centre, which is the SFI Centre for Energy, Climate and Marine, based in Cork. And then at the other end of the country, we have Trish Murphy, Project Officer at the Inishone Rivers Trust in Donegal. So before I pass over to these speakers, just to go to one or two very short items of housekeeping. So we will have a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. So would welcome any questions you may have for our speakers. You have a, a questions panel on your screen, so you can send through your questions at any time and we will get through them at the end. Also, we would very much welcome your feedback as well. You'll get a, an email from us afterwards requesting your feedback. That's really valuable to us for shaping other events in this webinar series. And also it's an opportunity that if there are any topics of particular interest, you could suggest those to us and we'll try our best to cover them throughout the year. And also, finally, last but not least, these webinars are being recorded. So if anything comes up or you get distracted throughout the morning, do not worry, you won't miss anything. We will make the recordings available to you on our KTI YouTube channel. And also recordings from previous webinars in the series are also available there so you can go back through them. So that is about enough from me this morning. I am now going to pass over to Brian O'Gallacor for our first presentation of the morning. Good morning. Uh, can I just check, can you see the screen? Yeah, we can see your presentation, Brian, Perfect. so you're good to go. Thanks very much. Thank you, Siobhan. I'm delighted to um, present at this um, workshop on the role of research in tackling climate change. Uh, as Siobhan mentioned, I'm from Marai, which is one of the Science Foundation Ireland research centres of scale. Uh, there are 17 of these research centres focusing on different topics around the country and gathering a lot of the, the research capacity, working with industry partners, so very topical, I think, for the um, this discussion today. Um, within Marai, we have about 220 researchers uh, around uh, Ireland. You can see on the bottom of the, the screen here are our, our academic partners. So we've um, a number of institutes, uh, academic institutes um, uh, involved in research um, we, and we work with about 80 industry partners. Um, we're always looking for opportunities to partner with uh, new, par new industry partners so we'd be very um, uh, very much looking forward to engaging with some of you out there. If you have ideas, want to contact us about uh, possible collaboration opportunities. Um, so this is our mission statement within Marai, and I've, I highlighted some of the areas in relation to, um, to climate. What our focus is on is to do excellent research that has significant societal benefit. Um, so the research has to be scientifically excellent, but also it has to have societal benefit. And we, we capture that societal benefit in terms of how well are we informing uh, policy? How well are we supporting business? And to what extent are we empowering society? So this uh, graphic shows our motivations uh, within Marai. So the, the research that we do uh, lies in one or more of these three categories, um, the energy transition, climate action and the blue economy. So we're, we're really, I suppose, inspired by the opportunities arising from Ireland's transition to, to a low carbon economy. With, with real opportunities in particular in the energy space, 
but also the blue economy, so harnessing the uh, our offshore uh, resources uh, in a sustainable way. Our impacts then, so the, the, what we use this research for is to, to support industry, inform policy and empower society. I'm going to speak about all of these three uh, impacts. So most of the focus of what I'm going to say is to introduce you to some of our research, but through the lens of how that research is supporting industry, informing policy and empowering society. So if we look firstly at the, the role that we play uh, within research in supporting industry, we, we do this in, um, in three ways. The first of these is supporting companies to innovate. So basically to translate ideas into economic activity. And there's three examples here of the many uh, collaborative research projects we have. Uh, on the left hand side, you see um, uh, the Ocean Energy Wave Energy device, uh, a company based in Cove, who've recently installed uh, a, a 1.2 megawatt wave energy device in the US naval base in Hawaii. In the center, you see some work we've done collaboratively with uh, an SME in the tidal energy space, G Kinetic. And they've tested the, uh, their tidal energy device uh, off the coast of, of France. And on the right hand side then, also some work we've been doing with companies in terms of how can they harness the opportunity uh, that's available to Ireland in terms of our massive offshore wind energy resource? So I'll, I'll go into in each of these in, in a bit more detail, just to give you a snapshot of the journey, I suppose, uh, associated with each of these. So this is the first one. The company is Ocean Energy. As I mentioned, they're a Cove-based company, and they wanted to develop a wave energy device. And on the right-hand side, you'll see the pictures I showed from the installation in Hawaii. But the journey to get to Hawaii goes right back to the left-hand side. And you can see it's a journey of nearly 20 years where we've been collaborating with uh, this company through various different stages of uh, the development. From the initial idea, you can see the, um, uh, the BBDB, the backward bent duck boy, as it was initially, right through to um, concept development and testing in our National Ocean Test Facility. Um, then we had testing in Nantes in France as part of an EU collaboration. Uh, we raised the scale of the device and uh, moved the testing out to Galway Bay. Um, then as part of another EU project, the Chorus project to test with a, a turbine uh, involved. And effectively, this brought us up to the, um, the process where we, we now have uh, effectively a large scale device uh, being tested in Hawaii. And you can see that it goes from the technology readiness levels of uh, basic concept uh, up to uh, technology readiness level eight, where we've got a, a full scale device that's being tested. A similar story in relation to our work with G Kinetic on tidal energy. So it started with a concept, um, and for that we used our uh, facility in Galway. Um, then we had some uh, SEAI funding that we supported them uh, with in terms of doing some testing in France. Um, this was followed by uh, the development of the, the Limerick Docks Marine Device Development Test Facility, where we were able to do some further testing uh, in 2016, 2017. Then we did some detailed modeling, some design analysis. And as you can see, all this then leads up to the, um, uh, uh, the tidal energy device testing, the 25 kilowatt, uh, smaller scale uh, for, for this one compared to the wave energy device. But that gives a sense of the story of the different aspects of research. And here you also see the different Marai institutions involved, uh, in this case, uh, Galway, Cork and Limerick. The third example then, it's, it's presented slightly differently in terms of here what I talk about is the, the four pieces of work we've been doing collaboratively with the, the industry partners that are named on the top in terms of how can offshore wind energy turn from uh, a, a significant resource into uh, an economic opportunity? So part of this was through data gathering. So this is a project that took place over a two-year period. 
focusing on data gathering, the geological, the bathymetry, the wave data. Also then uh, floating offshore substructures, how can we reduce the costs? Uh, the costs in moving wind energy offshore are significant, but the benefits are also significant. On the top then you see the, um, uh, the focus on blue hydrogen. So and, and it, this is an alternative way to harness the electricity from offshore wind. So we can, we can transmit the electricity directly onshore, but we could also use that electricity offshore to develop what's called blue hydrogen and transmit uh, transfer the hydrogen onshore and then that hydrogen can be used by businesses uh, it can be used in freight transport areas of the energy system that are difficult to electrify uh, can be met by hydrogen it's also a way of dealing with the variability of offshore wind because you're using the resource uh, after you're harnessing it or at a different time to when you're harnessing it and critically, of course, then the environmental impacts. What are the environmental impacts of offshore wind energy and how can we develop this resource, ensuring uh, that there aren't uh, negative impacts? So that's three examples of working with companies to innovate. Another part of our uh, supporting industry has been working with companies to plan. So to develop their strategies to harness the opportunities from the low carbon future. So the first example here is ESB's strategy which was published a few years ago. And this focuses on decarbonizing electricity and then electrifying heat and transport. And our collaborative research with ESB helped to inform and underpin that strategic development and gave them confidence that this was the way to go. And their brighter future strategy now is, is, is really embedded within the company. Um, in the middle there you see the Vision 2050 document from Gas Networks Ireland. Again, we worked collaboratively with Gas Networks Ireland to see how could the gas network become carbon neutral by 2050. And this involves uh, renewable gas from biomethane and from hydrogen and also exploring the opportunities for natural gas with carbon capture and storage. And on the right hand side then, work we did with IBEC and their members. So we facilitated a number of workshops to help IBEC to develop a, a strategy for uh, building a low carbon economy. So a, a roadmap for the industry sector. The third way in which we've supported companies is in reducing their carbon footprint. So on the left hand side here, you see one of the uh, uh, sites down in Ring So the pharmaceutical sector down there, we've been collaborating with them over a number of years. Firstly, in terms of intelligent efficiency, so reducing their energy bill and using the energy more efficiently. And then more recently, they had an interest in reducing their carbon footprint further. So uh, installing wind energy, uh, tur wind turbines, and how can that wind turbine generated electricity be absorbed into the company and used uh, most effectively in terms of meeting the company's uh, electricity needs and reducing their electricity bill. We've worked with business in the community on the low carbon pledge and the, the challenge of moving from a um, carbon pledge is based on carbon intensity to actually emission, redu emissions reductions. Um, and then finally on the bottom right you see uh, Irish distillers. We've done some work with them in um, the uh, Middleton distillery in terms of how to make the first carbon neutral whiskey uh, in the world. So working with companies to reduce their carbon footprint is the third uh, way in which we've supported companies. In terms of informing policy, this is another uh, outcome of our uh, research. And this has been done on national, EU and global uh, stages. So one example there is the support we provided to the Climate Action Plan, which was published uh, in the summer 2019. In the middle there, you see the, um, um, uh, an outcome of some collaborative work we did with the International Renewable Energy Agency on the renewable energy prospects for the EU. And this research underpinned uh, the EU's decision to increase its renewable amb ambition uh, for 2030. And then finally, the Intergovernmental Panel uh, on Climate Change report on how can we achieve the, the politically agreed 1.5 degree limit for global warming. And uh, work that we've done on deep decarbonisation uh, at national level was referenced in that report. So our research has informed policy 
focusing on the national policy in a bit more detail, uh, we produced Ireland's first low carbon energy roadmap in 2013. And this provided some pathways by which Ireland could uh, achieve significant emissions reductions in the energy system. And this provided confidence in the policy system to legislate for climate action in 2015. We also supported the government in um, their negotiations with the European Union uh, in 2014 and this led to the uh, agreed framework at EU level uh, including what each of the member states must do to, to meet the overall ambitions. Um, in 2015, we did some modeling work for the Department of Energy to inform the, the, the white paper on energy. And this analysis focused not just on the uh, low carbon um, parts of the energy uh, challenge, but also how do we maintain energy security? How do we address energy poverty and other topics? So they fed into the uh, Department of Energy's low carbon uh, white paper uh, published in 2015. We also used, did some analysis in collaboration with Energy Innovation Ireland to inform the uh, uh, research strategy for Ireland, and that was published in 2016. In 2017, uh, we did some analysis for the Department of Energy and Climate on the uh, national mitigation plan. So what would be required in the energy system to meet the ambitions under the national mitigation plan? and the National Mitigation Plan was, was um, published in 2017. In 2018, we looked at how could Ireland increase its ambition. Uh, there was a clear change in political leadership towards an increase in ambition, and that's continued uh, to this day. That fed into the Climate Action Plan in 2019. And then more recently, um, earlier uh, in 2020, we had the um, uh, support for the politicians who are deliberating on what to do uh, in terms of climate change um, and what kind of level of ambition made sense for Ireland and what were the implications of different ambitions and that fed into the programme for government uh, uh, strategy for uh, climate action or targets rather for, for climate action and emissions reduction. So that's some of the ways in which we uh, informed different policy um, decisions um, but I want to just reflect on, on just one example, one kind of anecdote, if you like, from that time. In 2018, we produced this document I mentioned where we were trying to support uh, the government thinking around increasing its ambition. We saw a tweet then for the minister at the time, Richard Bruton, who was attending one of the COP meetings, one of these uh, UN meetings on, on climate change. And when we looked more closely and we zoomed in to see what it was that he was actually reading, uh, we saw um, uh, with some level of pride that he was actually reviewing the document that we'd submitted to the civil servants. Um, so it's great to see this kind of impact too when the, the, uh, the research that you're doing uh, is read by the, the ministers uh, responsible for the policy area. The third and final uh, priority impact area is in terms of empowering society. Um, and the um, one example of what we're doing here is, is trying to improve the, the way in which we engage with citizens on climate. Uh, it's very clear that with all the technologies, all the policies and all the uh, industry support, um, it's still not enough if you don't have the societal uh, buy-in, the societal um, activity. Uh, if we don't support communities and citizens to get involved in this um, in this massive undertaking uh, to transition to a low carbon future. So within this project called Imagining 2050, we research different ways in which we could engage with citizens. Um, also different ways in which we could present the information back to citizens on those engagements. And it was a very rich and learning experience. Um, uh, and from that, we're developing a toolkit for citizen engagement. Another example of a project that we've done in this empowering society space is supporting local climate action. So there's a very ambitious and significant activity down on the Dingle Peninsula. And we're a partner in the what's called the Dingle Peninsula 2030 uh, uh, collaboration, which involves ESB networks, ourselves, 
and partners on the ground, the Dingle Hub and Northeast West Kerry Development. And some of the activity that we've done there has been to, um, I suppose, support and inform the development of an energy master plan for the region, but also engage with the schools uh, as part of the, the citizen and community engagement organizing a climate hack and getting the secondary school students to consider what options uh, they might like for their area. So that kind of brings us to, to an end of this uh, kind of snapshot on how we've um, helped support business, helped uh, inform policy and also to empower society. Our, our research, as I mentioned, has to be excellent. And one of the ways in which that's measured is uh, by scientific peer review. So we have the, the publications that we generate being peer reviewed and uh, published in journals, but also then every now and again, we get a, an international panel of reviewers come and scrutinize what we do and make a judgment on it. This is some of the reflections from our six year review. So uh, our phase one of MARI was from the period shown in the uh, graph 2013 to 2019. And we're now in year two of phase two, so year two of six. So we've four years to go. We're very, um, very anxious to increase and expand our collaboration with industry, the, the work we do in informing policy and uh, empowering society. And we'd be delighted to have the opportunity to discuss with those of you who haven't engaged with us what opportunities there might be uh, for our research to support your business, but also to uh, to really contribute to climate action. And with that, I'll close and uh, I'll hand back to Siobhan. Uh, and thank you very much. I look forward to this discussion. Thank you, Brian. That was a really great overview of the, the wide ranging expertise available at the Marai Centre in Cork and the impacts that it's had at a national level and also at an individual company level. So now I'm um, pleased to hand over to Trish Murphy from Initial Rivers Trust. Uh, Trish is going to give an example of you know, a, a problem that they had in Donegal and how they engaged academic expertise to come up with solutions for that. So I'll hand over to Trish. Hi, um, thank you very much, uh, Siobhan, and um, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. So um, as Siobhan was saying there, um, the Inishon Rivers Trust um, got involved with a climate related project um, back in 2017, 2018 and onwards. And really I'm here today to talk about how we collaborated with academia on that and the experiences that we had with that. So um, just so that everybody is aware of what a Rivers Trust is, a Rivers Trust is a grassroots organisation that involves um, community um, at a local level in engaging with their water and um, you know, trying to improve, conserve and protect um, the, the water environment and also to provide a benefit for the community while doing that. So the Rivers Trusts in Ireland, um, we, there is a number of them now around the country. You can see from this map here, there's 11 within the Republic and eight within Northern Ireland. There's also lots of other catchment associations and there's continually more um, organisations um, growing and building. Now, so just to show you where we are in particular, we're up here on the um, Inishon Peninsula. Um, can you see me okay there? Um, so we're up here on the Inishon um, uh, Peninsula up here at the very top of Ireland near Mallon Head. So we, our journey to establishing a trust began um, in 2013. And um, after that, we, we set about setting up a board. So we went to spend some time going around the peninsula discussing with community. So community is very much at the heart of what we do. So um, after a couple of years uh, going around the peninsula and just chatting to people um, all on a voluntary basis that we eventually established our first board in October 2015. Um, that board then was tasked with establishing us as a CLG um, and that's, uh, that happened in August 2016. Uh, finally then we became a charity in 2015. We currently have nine directors on board and we have been voluntary up until last July when we got um, funding for one staff member, which is myself. So um, to date, we've been funded by um, a range of different organisations. So in particular, the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage um, and the Local Authorities Water Programme, which is administered through the Rivers Trust. 
but there's lots of other organizations that we've been um, collaborating with as well. So just in terms of what we do on the ground, as I said, we're very much community based. Um, we do, you know, cleanups, we go to agricultural shows, you know, all the while engaging people with water issues and um, pressures on water, but trying to you, you just raise awareness around um, water engagement. Uh, we do tree planting, um, we run events um, and we also do quite a lot of training. Um, so here's a few um, of the training um uh programs that we've run with people so electrofishing hydromorphology um invasive species control tree planting and and in the bottom right hand corner there is a restoration project that we were involved with so um so where does the climate bit come in i mean obviously um the tree planting's uh, action to take against uh climate um our climate challenges but the big reason that we're involved um, with flooding is because of the initial flood back in 2017. So in August 2017, there was a, um, a one in a hundred year event um, for Inishon, and we um, we suffered a severe amount of damage at that time. It wasn't just Donegal, it was parts of Derry as well. So um, after this happened, the Inishon Rivers Trust was a fledgling organisation really at the time. So we thought about what we could do in terms of that. Um, we attended a conference in the UK, which talked a lot about natural flood management. And so we decided to bring this back to Inishon. And that's when we ran our first event um, on natural flood management, which we called Slow the Flow. Um, it was at this um, event that we invited Professor Mary Burke from Trinity um, University, who, um, who gave us a talk um, as um, one of Ireland's leading flood experts, she gives a talk about climate change and about, you know, what's, what the challenges are coming down the line in terms of flooding. And then the other speakers talked about, um, you know, what natural flood management is. So, for instance, Dan Turner from the Yorkshire Jails Rivers Trust, where they do a lot of NFM over there, that he came on to talk about what they, that they did. Um, the OPW spoke about their involvement with flood risk management plans and about the prospects for NFM. And we also had the inland fisheries in terms of how they were um, managing floods that were hitting the rivers quite severely. So it was after that event that we became uh, much more engaged and in actively doing things um, on flooding and bringing this to in a show. And so we ran two events. Um, we got funding through the Community Water Development Fund, which is run by LawPro. And we ran two events on restoring rivers and also using rivers. So, for instance, taking a measure that you would use in NFM, and that would be repairing woodlands. So we, we had the Forestry Service up with us to speak about that. And that's engaging communities. It's very much about, you know, demonstrating to people what these kind of measures are about, because there are not many examples in Ireland. And it was just to sort of, you know, get that message across to people to start with. So at this time also, we um, uh, were uh, tendering out for a project um, to do a scoping project in Inishowen. So that's where our collaboration with um, Mary from Trinity um, came in. So we had um, tendered um, for this scoping project, um, a few tender results came through and then Mary was the awarding contract and we developed this project with her, which ran between February 2019 and January 2020. So in terms of the process of the collaboration, um, we secured the funding, you know, the normal process is securing the funding, tending out, sending out the tender request then to the flooding consultants. There was a slight change around there. We actually did number two there on the list first and then went on to secure the funding. Um, but we had, um, after that, we, you know, evaluating the tenders, Mary's was the winning tender. Um, beyond that, then we negotiated a contract with Consult Trinity. Um, the project commenced in February 19, 2019. Um, throughout the year then, Mary and her team were here doing site visits and ground throughing. And then the project was completed and launched in February 2020. And you can see Mary here speaking at the launch in a community centre up here in Carndona and in Shone. So um, in terms of the benefits of the collaboration for the Inishone Rivers Trust, um, this was a research-based project, and so it was a good match of the, our, our requirements versus the skill set um, that Mary could bring to the table. As well as that, it was an academic team 
So um, it wasn't just one consultant that we were bringing in. Um, we have to bear in mind that our resources were limited. We were very lucky to be 100% funded by the OPW on this, but it was limited. So it was great to have an actual team for that um, cost. So Mary brought that team, her students, and also she brought in Paul Quinn from the University of Newcastle on this. So that was another benefit for this academic collaboration was that Mary could engage a wide range of contacts, including people from the UK. Um, there's also, just in terms of a community perspective, the expectation that academic input increases the scientific outcome, um, or indeed the level of innovation that we were getting from this. Um, and that is the, this is the general expectation within the community and also um, probably from the agency's perspective as well. Now that's not to say that you won't get that from contractors, but that is the expectation that we feel is out there. Um, as well as that, you know, collaborating in this project does increase the credibility of the trust, um, both from a community and an agency perspective. Um, we ended up with a very high quality report. And um, on top of that, the financial management of the project was very easy because we were dealing with um, uh, Trinity Consult on that. Um, so beyond the project, um, once it was completed and launched in February 2020, um, we went on to do a community consultation. So at the launch itself, the community engaged and we consulted with them there. But beyond that, we went on to do another consultation. As soon as the first lockdown had ended, we were straight out um, to, um, to run a, an event with the community in Clonmany. So at that time, we presented to them about uh, you know, how did the community feel about this? Now, Mary and Paul Quinn were very um, uh, helpful and they spoke at this event now they did this online it was done um uh, via zoom at the time um and so it, it worked out great we were physically there with the community um and then the academia came in via zoom so we presented to them about this concept of co-design and co-production that with the community knowledge and with the scientific knowledge that we'd already gotten from academia that we could you know together we could design and produce effective nature-based solutions in terms of NFM for the area. Clonmany suffers quite heavily from flooding on a regular basis um, and was very badly damaged during the 2017 flood. Now we found that there was a very good appetite at the time and the community um, gave us the mandate to go ahead and so we went on to apply for funding for this. One of the things that we did present to the community at the time was about the, the potential benefits for them for getting involved in this. So this will be one of the graphics that we presented to them that night. You know, it was about protecting their homes and protecting their business premises, but it was also increasing their well-being. I mean, there's a lot of frustration for people who live in, in areas that are prone to flooding. And there's a lot of losses to the community just in terms of the roads, their homes, you know, the lack of um, the lack of the impact on the economic activity when the flooding happens. So, um, but we highlighted in particular the flood regulation aspect of this, that we would be, you know, maybe NFM can't um, work for a one in a hundred flood, but it can certainly make an impact on nuisance flooding and maybe even up as far as one in 25 year floods. So there is a, a gain to be made from that, as well as the multiple co-benefits from a nature-based solutions. So it's about climate resilience and improving the water quality in the area. So um, that was in July, 2020. And since then we've moved on to um, apply for additional funding through EU Leader, but we've also gotten um, funding from Law Pro, additional match funding from Law Pro, from uh, Donegal County Council and from the OPW. Um, so we did find that the scoping study improved our chances of successfully securing that funding. I mean, without it, it would have been a very difficult sell, but we we definitely showed that there was potential for this within an show. And, and so we've moved on now to the implementation stage, which started in January. So we have a flooding consultant, we've got a landowner liaison officer engaged, um, an ecologist and a works contractor who will be implementing um, the uh, recommendations of the flooded consultant um, on the ground. So this project will probably run for about a year. Um, and so if you tune back in next year, we'll let you know how we get on with that. So um, just our final thoughts on, on, on our collaboration um, with Trinity. 
Um, I, I would say from a community perspective, the community groups very clearly need to define what their needs are. And, and this will definitely help them then to find the right academic partner. Um, you know, if your project is very much action based, maybe um, you, you need to be looking for academic partners that are very much action based themselves or whether they're research based. So this was a research based project and Mary had a lot of experience in that. So it very much matched what we needed. Um, I would also recommend that methodologies are established right from the start of the project and that the deliverables, you know, that you establish what your deliverables are going to be at the end. We were expecting um, a good high quality report, but what we what we expected within that report was also defined. So identifying the goals of each partners is very helpful too for making sure that it runs smoothly. So, you know, what does the research partner want out of this? And, and what does the community want out of this? So, you know, we would match those quite well too, just so that everybody is very happy and there are no hiccups during the project. So um, what was also very beneficial for this project was that the financial arrangements were very clearly marked out, uh, you know, that, you know, the, the payment schedules, things like that. So how the project is going to run. So um, it, I suppose in summary, it was a very successful project for us and it's helped us to move on um, with, with our project for the community. And hopefully we'll have some further engagement with academia in the future. And we'll certainly be keeping in contact with um, Mary and Paul about how the project goes on the ground. So thank you very much, everyone. And looking forward to the Q&A as well. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. Um, some really great examples there and advice for, for our companies listening. Uh, just before we get to the Q&A, I just want to highlight two supports that we have available through KTI. Um, for those of you that aren't very familiar with KTI, we do have a lot of very practical resources available through our website. They're, they're freely available to the business and the academic community. But I just want to highlight two of them. So Brian has mentioned SFI and there are a lot of uh, supports available through SFI through Enterprise Ireland, through um, a lot of the Irish government agencies and also the EU agencies, it can be very difficult to know where to start, um, to know what supports are, are eligible for your business. So we have our RDNI funding tool available on the KTI website, which brings together the supports from all these agencies and it presents it in a very easy to navigate way where you can put in the size of your business, the type of project that you want to carry out, and it will give you a, a list of those supports that are eligible for your business. And then just moving on very quickly, um, another support that I want to highlight is our find an expert support, um, just there on our next slide. We can move it along. Um, this support is also you know, a very useful tool for those of you that are very new to engaging with the research sector. It can be very hard to identify who is the key expert in your space. So we have a tool available that pulls in information from all the, um, the libraries throughout the Irish universities and the Irish Institutes of Technology and then categorises um, our academic community by their research interests. So you can go through this, it will pull up people that are publishing in your particular area of interest and then it will give you contact details for these people. So it's, it's a really good way of finding out who's active in your space. Um, we'll send you around a link to these following on from the webinar as well. So I will move on to the Q&A. Uh, thank you all for sending in your questions. We have some really great questions coming in for both our speakers. Um, I suppose that the first one is for both of you. And it's a question that comes up quite a lot when we're looking at Irish research. I think as a society in Ireland, um, you know, we do often look internationally for best practice. But how good are we as a society at coming up with innovation projects and coming up with ideas for the future in this space of climate action, um, energy and marine? So, um, Brian, I'm just going to get your views first and then Trish, I'll ask for your views as well. That's a great question, uh, Siobhan, thanks. Um, how good are we? Um, now, it's also a very open question, I, I, I would suggest. And I think what we found is in Ireland, there are areas in the climate space where we are world leading. Um, 
and then there's other areas where we've less expertise and less uh, and that's where we probably draw more on on the international uh, experts uh, one that jumps to mind uh, in the climate space is in terms of how we've managed to change our electricity system um, from being um, a very high carbon to a much lower carbon uh, electricity system over the last 20 years or so. Um, so what we've done in terms of um, integrating variable wind energy into our power system has been world leading. Um, and that's, that's just one example. Another area where we're leading would be in the space of um, a, a biogas research. So generating and using uh, renewable gas as opposed to natural gas uh, in order to um, uh, be able to heat um, our, our buildings differently, to be able to transport, in particularly for freight transport. Um, now that's an area where we're, there's a difference between these two because on the wind energy one there was a very strong partnership of industry and um, research and there was a very strong policy focus so it all kind of the pieces of the jigsaw were in place in, in the area of biogas we'd be we'd be world leading on the research side but we're later to the uh, activity in terms of that industry partnership and the um, uh, the policy supports um, but they'd be just two examples I'd give. There's, uh, there are many more, um, but um, I think in terms of how industry and companies work with research, one is a success story and the other is partial success, I'd say, at this stage. Perfect. And Trish, I'll ask for your views on that same question. Okay. Um, well, I'll focus a bit more on the community side of things. Um, I mean, Irish people are great talkers. Um, we're great at talking about solutions and coming up with great ideas. And I find having worked with the community and within environmental sectors and ac across Donegal, I'm involved with the Public Participation Network as well. Um, we are very much into climate justice actually at the moment. And I, and I believe that Ireland is very much a leader in terms of climate law. So, um, but the, and I think that comes from this, you know, um, you know, this desire to do what's fair and right within Irish communities. Um, so I, I would say that there's a lot of talk about um, what's the, the, the right way to do things. And I do find that entrepreneurship is, is very good as well within Ireland. And, and if that's translating into climate projects and climate, you know, um, proposals, that Brian might be working on, that's amazing. You know, there are amazing things that go on. From our perspective, in terms of our project on flooding, flooding is relatively new. The flooding, the natural flood management is a relatively new concept in, in Ireland. But, you know, I'm, I'm confident that we will get, you know, we'll move further on with that quite quickly. I mean, in the UK, they are a bit ahead of us on that. Um, but that's probably because they've been suffering more from floods than we have. They seem to have been hit more by this climate change effects before we do. We, we seem to have been a bit more resilient to that, but in the last few years we've we've had quite some quite significant and frequent flooding events and the anticipation is that there will be more um, you know due in the future. So um, you know I suppose watch this space in terms of, of natural flood management um, and I, I'm sure there'll be a lot of the uh, larger companies that will, you know, the, the, those who do flood risk management and things like that will be bring, will be rolling this into what they already do quite well. So. Brilliant. And so I have a question for yourself, Brian. Um, we have a lot of academics tuned into our webinar today. So the question is, how can academic research groups access the resources available through BRI and how can they work with you on innovation projects? Another great, um, great question. Uh, the, the the first thing would be to get in touch. That that would be the the first thing I'd say. We we have uh, contact details on our website marai.ie, and uh, as I mentioned, um, 
uh, at the start, at, at the moment, uh, of all the research centres that SFI fund, um, we're the largest in terms of numbers of academic institutes uh, involved. So we're, we're already quite extensive uh, across the country and many of the universities, the ITs and the um, um, uh, research institutes are already involved, but we're always open to um, to, to more par to greater participation, and, and this can be either from uh, groups who were within those institutions or indeed uh, new institutions. Um, and I suppose just reflecting back on like the, the the transition for us from phase one to phase two, you know, we we would have added the um, participation uh, significantly in terms of. Uh, not only the, the number of institutions, but the number of research groups within institutions. So, so please get in touch if your if your research is in the area of of energy, climate, and marine. We'd be delighted to talk to you and talk about how we can support you. So, it's for us, it's an ongoing process where we're we're uh, increasingly uh, engaging with new academic partners in the same way we're engaging with new companies uh, and industry partners. Brilliant. And, and Trish, along the lines of that, um, also looking at working with academics, you mentioned Mary Burke at Trinity. How did you how did you come to know about Mary and how did you how did you recognize that her skill set was the right match for your project? Um well, Mary had been mentioned to us by, I think it was the OPW who actually mentioned Mary to us um, as uh, being a leading academic in Ireland on this. And um, Mary had only just returned. She had been abroad working in you know, places like the US and Australia, and she'd only returned within the last few years to Ireland. And so she was setting herself up really as a, as a leader in the field here. So. Um, I suppose, you know, there was that connection there. I mean, we did tender for the project, so we spoke to other consultants um, who, you know, uh, who were, you know, would be people out, you know, doing contracted work, um, um, looking at environmental issues on rivers and things like that. But Mary, you know, had a very, very good proposal for us. And I think her proposal initially came up with a very clear methodology of what way this would work. I mean, we identified what we needed, and then she came up with a very clear way to do that. So it was it was a very, very good match, really, uh, um, right from the outset. So, I mean, we knew it was gonna be largely uh, research-based, it was desk-based, but there was that ground through thing. And then, you know, we got on well, so it was great. And, and Mary was very much, um, you know, believes in the community side of this as well. And that's very, very important to us. So, you know, I talked about the fact that, you know, what are our goals and our aims, each of the partners. So our goals and aims are to make sure that the community is involved in this, because we really believe that the community is essential to making this work. They, we have to have the community engaged. They, it needs to work for them because they're the people who will be caring for these kind of measures on the ground. And so, um, Mary very much um, uh, agreed with that approach and so therefore it was a great match. I mean, it, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure lots of people believe that this is the right approach, but it's the act, you know, active, actively doing it as well. And she was very active in that. So it was, it, it worked out very well. Brilliant. And I'm just conscious of time. So I'm going to pose one last question to both our speakers this morning. We've got quite a lot of comments coming in from SMEs who, um, you know, are under pressure with the day-to-day -day running of their business, you know, are often struggling with capacity issues and having the bandwidth to get involved in R&D projects. So I would just love to have some final thoughts from yourself, Brian, on, you know, why you think that SMEs would benefit from getting involved in doing R&D with research organisations and also, Trish, from, from your own perspective perspective, you're not an SME, but why the NGO sector could benefit from getting involved with the, the research base. Thanks, Siobhan. A, a great question. And and we, we, we see this all the time with the SMEs that we engage with, you know, the struggles they have to, to keep the day-to-day -day operation going and finding the bandwidth to be able to explore research opportunities. I suppose the, the, the key benefits would be um, what we've seen in those journeys that I showed you from those two companies, just two examples, and there's, there's examples from, from other 
part of the energy uh, activity as well. But those two examples showed how we uh, supported those companies in a number of ways. Firstly, getting that initial idea into something that might uh, be able to generate money. Um, but secondly, supporting them in accessing funding, because we're very familiar with the different funding sources that are available for uh, for research, uh, be it national funding sources uh, or the international um, uh, the EU projects. And these uh, funding applications can be daunting for SMEs. So part of the real benefit we've seen and we've heard uh, in terms of feedback from the SMEs is the support in um, in, in accessing those funding uh, sources that are available. And of course, the funding sources then enable the activity to, to develop, to expand within the company. So it, it's an important step to, to kind of, um, I suppose, reflect for SME, to reflect on the bandwidth they have and see if there's, can they squeeze additional uh, bandwidth and time to explore these opportunities because the benefits can be significant um, but it's, it is a real challenge for companies and and some of the funding sources uh, don't make it necessarily easy you know in terms of the procedures and the processes they have uh, but again that's that's an area we can help a, a third one would be in in terms of the that that journey from you know from an idea to what might be a, a kind of the market delivery or the economic opportunity. So translating that idea into future jobs and future income generation. So talking to them about the again the opportunities we've seen from the stories of of other companies who've partnered with us, and um, and and what those possibilities might be. Um, right, well, I would totally agree with that, with what Brian's saying about the difficulties with funding. That is a key um, a challenge for community groups as well. Um, uh, you know, and it is something that, um, you know, I would always urge funding organisations to think about how the communities can deal with this. I mean, a lot of these funds are drawdown funds as well. So um, the problem that the communities have is that they do not have the money up front to manage these projects or to, to, to be able to deliver on these projects. And that limits the size of the project that they can complete. So, you know, once you get beyond, say, 10K, you know, community groups start to struggle quite significantly. And it actually puts them off applying for funding applications. Uh, we, we have found that within the PPN here in Donegal that organisations won't go for the funding because of, because of that reason. Also, there's an awful lot of administrative um, challenges with it as well. But, um, you know, just in terms of the benefits and that, I, I really think that the innovative side of it is very important because, um, you know, the, the universities and academia, they're keeping up to date with the new um you know new solutions and uh, you know new processes that are out there and that can be a real benefit to the community groups then they can get ahead and get these solutions instead of going about things in an older way something that they you know make somebody else might have done five years ago but there's actually a better way to do it and academia are the ones that are at the forefront of that they're the ones who are finding those solutions and and then if you know working with the community on that to come up with solutions that fit locally as well so um i would say you know that um another benefit really that uh, academia brings is the student aspect as well i mean that's great because the, the researchers have students that need experience and so community groups can get little projects done on the ground just by having a student involved and it doesn't cost them anything so um that you know that's that's a that's a very nice way to go and it's very kind of reliable because it's supervised work as well so it's kind of reliable work too so yeah but there are certainly challenges as brian says Brilliant. Some really great advice from our speakers there in our Q&A. Um, I'm going to bring our, our Q&A to a close now. There seems to be a lot of interest amongst our audience in this topic, so I would just encourage you that you will be getting your feedback forms after this webinar has closed. So please do use that as a, a way of communicating with us. And if you do want us to delve into this 
in more detail, uh, we'd be very happy to do that over the course of the webinar series. So please do share those views with us. So with that, I'd just like to thank our speakers this morning for their, their time and their great presentations. Um, I'd like to thank Brian O'Gallacore and Trish Murphy. Um, and also just to mention that our next webinar in the series is happening on the 2nd of March, and we're going to be looking at licensing agreements from Irish universities and institutes of technology. So that's going to be a really practical session on how to license out the results of research projects. So we hope you'll join us at that. Thank you for attending this morning and have a lovely day.